Welcome, everybody. It's lovely to see you again, Lewis. Uh, we, we, we seem to be getting slightly closer. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe in about four months' time we could sit in comfy chairs again. I'm, I'm not sure what it is. Um, uh, thanks for joining us again today. Uh, we've got quite a bit, a lot to cover. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions over the last two or three weeks about organisational change, sadly redundancies, how do I restructure my business, how do I make it more efficient. So we're going to focus mostly on that today. But it would be remiss if we didn't just talk a little bit about JobKeeper number two, as it were. Um, we won't go into great detail on JobKeeper. We'll just touch on it if we can. Next Thursday, uh, Joe Murphy and Ian Rennie will be doing JobKeeper number two to death. Yes. So please, if you really want to get into the minutiae of uh, the second round of JobKeeper, uh, tune in to them because that would be really, really useful. But we might, we might just kick off. We'll do JobKeeper. And I think we'll talk through um, the whole restructuring question, both the HR side, the practice side, and the technical side. Now, you've been reading up better than me over the last three days, so I'm going to hand over to you to start with. So we've, we've had the announcement that many people have probably heard that the federal government's JobKeeper scheme, which is due to conclude on the 27th of September, will be extended for a further two quarters or, um, in layman speak, it will be extended for six months until uh, effectively the end of March. Now, the, there are some changes, so we'll, we'll just walk through briefly what the key changes are. The, the first thing for all employers to be conscious of is from now till the 27th of September, nothing changes. So that is, if you're currently receiving JobKeeper payments, if you're currently exercising JobKeeper powers under the Fair Work Act, all of that continues as it currently stands until the 27th so of September. Business as usual till the 27th of September. Exactly. Um, from the 28th of September, JobKeeper 2.0 uh, kicks into play. And what that does is it provides ongoing wage subsidies of a similar nature to what we're currently, uh, employers are currently availing themselves of, but there is a reduced rate. And so as many employers know, you're currently receiving $1,500 a fortnight in wage subsidies, that will reduce to either $1,200 a fortnight or $750 a fortnight. Now, the reason we have two differing amounts is that the government has decided to change the level of subsidy depending on how much work an employee was performing back in March of this year. So the, the actual criterion or the yardstick they're using to determine how much of a subsidy an employee will get is based on the four weeks that they worked in March of 2019. And effectively, the government said if an employee was working in those four weeks... 2019 or 2020? Apologies, <laughs> uh, 2020. If, 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 the, if the employee was working in those four weeks um, an average of 20 hours per week or more, they will receive for their position the greater subsidy of 1,200 per fortnight. If the employee was working an average of 20 hours per week or less, or sorry, less than 20 hours per week, then it's, it's the lower subsidy. So that's why we've got two different subsidies for the December quarter. And you'll see in the March quarter, so the three months from um, uh, leading into March 2021, um, it's the same notion, except the amounts are reduced again to 1,000 per fortnight or 650 per fortnight. Um, the other key change, if we go to the next slide, is, and we've just talked through the 20-hour test there, the other key change is the eligibility criteria based on revenue. Now, th this will affect a large number of businesses because the way JobKeeper was set up initially was almost on a, what you might call a set and forget basis, yeah. which was that once you Pro met... Prove you've hit the test once and you're good. That's right. Once you met that revenue decline of either 30% uh, for certain businesses or if you had a greater turnover of, of over... Um, a particular amount, which I think was a, a billion, it was uh, a test of uh, 50%. 50 and, and 15 for charities. And 15% for charities. Once you met that uh, at the particular test time, it didn't matter if your revenue then increased, you were still able to access JobKeeper all the way till 27 September. When we get into JobKeeper 2.0, you will need to show that decline in revenue of 30 or 50% for, as we start in September, for the June and September quarters. And um, when we go into the March quarter, it's the th previous three quarters, you'll need to have shown that each of them have a reduction of 30 or 50% compared to the same time in 2019. So 
there's effectively an ongoing revenue decline threshold that's going to be tested on a periodic basis to maintain the payments. So we will see some employers probably fall out of the JobKeeper scheme as a result of that, um, but that's just tightening up the criteria. Um, uh, look, uh, Joe and Ian will go through this in fine detail next next week, so just as I said, t- tune in on Thursday, so that, that'll be fine. So essentially what we're seeing is, is a tailoring off of the support. Yes. But it's now going to at least tailor off over a reasonably long period of time, about six months on top of the original scheme. Yes. We're seeing a change to whether or not as an employer I'm in or out. And if my business is starting to improve month to month, I might find myself out. Yep. If I'm still in the terrible state I was, I'm probably still going to find myself in. The next question then is as well, at the moment I can issue JobKeeper directions, stand down directions, far more beneficial than the Fair Work Act. Are they, are they going to continue or are they going to stop? So um, the, the Fair Work Act changes will continue, as we said, till 27 September. The the Prime Minister has made some comments um, which have been quite positive about the legislative changes that are currently in place. Uh, The Prime Minister's almost said that or inferred that the industrial reform that has taken place today must continue as a complement to JobKeeper, but we haven't actually seen what that looks like. And I think there's probably three possible solutions um, that we'll see. The, the first is a short-term extension of the existing Fair Work Act amendments. So those employers that are availing themselves of some of the Fair Work uh, flexibilities that have been introduced, one option is that continues. The other is that longer-term reforms are initiated and um, some employers may be aware of the working group process that is ongoing at um, the policy level between key union and employer organisations and the government. Nigel, you're involved in that, but I understand can't talk about it. Because... It's all in the secrecy. So, so there are there are dis- discussions ongoing about that. I think one of the issues with that being implemented in September is longer-term reform obviously takes more time than, than temporary changes. And the third possibility is a full reversion back to the, the old Fair Work Act provisions. I, I probably see that as the least likely yep. outcome. Probably the easiest thing for the government to do is to just do a short-term extension of the temporary amendments we currently have. But they're the options. We just don't know um, which one it will be at the moment and we'll certainly update employers once we do. So I think, think the takeaways are JobKeeper's staying at least, it, it, JobKeeper's staying to when it was originally planned to stay, 27 September. It's thing that'll live on for another six months but in a slightly different form. The level of subsidy is going to be progressively reducing over that period. We've got this new 20 hour test people are gonna have to get their mind around. Uh, the rules will change after 27 September about whether or not the employer's in or out, and they'll have to make some assessment of that. And as we said, Joe and uh, uh, Ian will go through that in some detail. And at the moment, those Fair Work Act provisions, which people might be relying on, particularly to stand people down in part or in whole, at the moment they live till 27 September, and we're having to watch that space yep. to see what replaces it. I'm with Lewis. I think they'll just get carried on probably until the end of the extra six months. But please stay in touch because obviously uh, there might be some subtle changes to them, just like there's been some subtle mm-hmm. changes to, to the rest of JobKeeper as well. So that, that, that's roughly what's happened in the last week or so. And um, I think it's good to see. It's a good policy initiative. I think if we'd have fallen off the cliff of JobKeeper, I don't know where we'd have gone mm-hmm. economically, Lewis. So I think it's a very good thing. But as I said as well, uh, Joe and Ian are going to spend the whole of the next webcast just bringing you up to date on the very fine details yep. around these issues. And, and the one thing that we, we haven't got yet is the actual legislative provisions giving effect to all of this. None of the details have been released yet. Hopefully by next week, Joe and Ian will have it. So there'll be a, the, the, the detail which a lot of people grappled and had difficulties with earlier, it's important you get across that it's, as well. Sadly, it's an old saying, but the devil is in the detail. That's right. There's no doubt about that. So that, that, that's, that's the JobKeeper update. Um, look, a lot of people wanted us to talk about restructuring, um, and we've got we've got two elements to today. We we I'm, I'm I'm impressed by our audience. I think our audience is sort of maturing as it goes by. We've been inundated with questions by our audience over the last three weeks, and we actually framed today completely around the questions. So hopefully we're going to answer many questions as we go. Although you've got, as always, the iPad in case something 
uh, quite interesting comes in as, as we're talking. There's sort of two, two parts to today. One is um, a, quite a number of large big companies said, gee, Nigel, when you actually go into a business and help them restructure, what's the actual approach you use? Uh, a lot of big businesses will be interested in what I've got to say, but I think there's a lot of learnings for smaller businesses. And then we've got a lot of what we might call uh, more, more technical questions, but they, they, they traverse both the HR side and the legal side. Yep. So that's roughly how we're going to run today if we can and see how we go, if we, see if we go well. <clears throat> so let's just talk about approach first of all and, and there's lots of approaches out there and you go to lots of consulting firms, you'll get lots of versions. I'm just going to tell you the one I use when I go into a business and see if, uh, see if that helps you. Um, look, I use what's called an activity-based analysis approach um, and there's probably two slides here which sort of give you an idea of how I think. This is the first one. And the first thing I'm always trying to understand uh, before I sort of get into the detail when I'm restructuring a business is what's the actual business model? What, what drives that business? What are its revenue levers? Uh, what, are the, what are its key customer segments? You really need to understand what the business model is. Then I tend to want to understand a little bit about, well, who's actually interacting with the customer? What sort of customer experience you're trying to generate? I then like to look at what I call the doers and makers. They're the people who actually do stuff in a business or they make stuff in a business. Because the question for those people is normally around cost, quality and output. And then I tend lastly to look at what I call the support functions. Uh, marketing, HR. Sometimes you might call sales a support function, sometimes you might not. Uh, finance, people of that. Lots of business called corporate services. Corporate services, that. corporate yeah. services, yeah. And that, that tends to be more around compliance and efficiency. So in terms of my sort of big picture thinking, that's normally how I would start. What I, what I would then do is I would jump into what's called an activity-based analysis. Um, and the first thing I tend to do is I normally get uh, copies of the business plans. I have a look at the existing organisational charts. Um, I normally ask for examples of position descriptions. Uh, I would normally have a look at rules dealing with delegation and authority. Um, and then I would normally interview the key stakeholders in the part of the business we're thinking about restructuring. And um, uh, that's an approach I've probably stuck with now for about 15 years. It's my preferred approach uh, because you tend to learn a great deal about what's going on, what should go on and how you can reshape it. When you do activity-based analysis, you find out who does what. Uh, you find out why they do it. You find out how much they do it. You find out who they do it for and you find out how important it is. <clears throat> and more often than not, you find out stuff the business actually doesn't understand. That You find out that... Lewis actually is the key person who does the monthly sales figures and nobody actually understood that Lewis actually did that job. So that's why I tend to do activity-based analysis. Um, it also helps you start to work out very quickly what you can stop doing. It helps you work out what you could perhaps uh, refine in terms of avoiding overlap in activity. And it also allows you to work out how to refocus people in their jobs. So you, you normally do stakeholder interviews first. And on the right-hand side, I've kind of put up the sort of things that we would tend to be looking at as we sort of work out what to do in a business. Obviously, the very first one is, is, is the structure you're going to propose, does it actually fit the business model? Is it, is it actually making sure those key drivers are properly resourced? I've talked about work, product and activity. I've already talked about that, making sure that you've got that right. Um, that tends to be very much around... Um, uh, the work people are doing, the quantity, the quality, the time, the level of resources it takes, the use of it in the business. Um, as I said, I tend to look very closely at the customer. I'm very big on looking at things like management ratios. I know that's a little bit old-fashioned, but I still do it. I think a lot of people get that wrong. So I tend to be wanting to see a traditional ratio of sort of one manager to eight employees in the normal circumstance maybe up to 1 to 20 if it's purely transactional, like a um, uh, telephone call centre. And if you've got a manager who's a thought leader doer, maybe down to 1 to 4. So I tend to look at management ratios to make sure they're about right. I'm a very big believer in examining delegations. You find a lot of organisations where people actually don't know the authority they've got in a job. Uh, it's very important to make sure that uh, people's authority isn't overlapping, because the minute you have overlapping authority, you create tension, so we'll tend to explore and examine all of that. And I tend to look at, particularly around the management side, what managements are actually doing. Are they spending all their time reporting up? 
Are they planning? Are they organising resources, instructing, reviewing work? Are they authoring, approving? Um, so there's a whole, a whole bag of things that you sort of look at to try and work out what's going on and then to make, uh, and you do that through the interviews, you do it through the activity analysis, and I normally make findings, and out of those findings I'll tend to make recommendations to the business about what's the most efficient way to actually restructure the business. Um, I've put down the bottom of the slide there my pet hates when I look at uh, organisations at the moment. Um, I, have a, I have four pet hates. Uh, I, I, I hate letterbox jobs, and you see there's a lot in, in corporate Australia. Uh, somebody, somebody is the receiver of a document. Um, it seems to sit in their letterbox for a long time, and then it seems to be sent somewhere else. They don't seem to be particularly productive, but you get a lot of letterbox jobs. Um, uh, touch with no value. I, I see a lot of people who are required in terms of internal process to sign things or touch things, don't add any value. Uh, the minute I see a, a capital application form that's got 12 signatures on it, I know nobody's actually taking responsibility for it. I, I like to find out who the meeting goers are. Um, tends, culturally, you tend to find a lot of businesses, people who go to every meeting aren't actually very productive people. And lastly, I like to find the sender honours, you know, those, those people who actually don't seem to do a lot themselves but always seem to be sending somebody somewhere else. So, look, that type of broad analysis is very, very useful to find out what's really happening, what needs to be kept, what needs to be changed, what needs to be brought together for better alignment and, and synergy. And I think, Nigel, just with those four bullet points down the bottom, I think the problem is as we've become more connected, so, and increasingly so even in, in this COVID era, so, Zoom meetings, video conferencing. There's been an ability for in, in a corporate organisation for lots of people to contribute on a decision that might not have been the case in the past. Um, email, the advent of email kind of started this a decade ago. Um, but the, the problem you, you get is with more people, you, you, you tend to sometimes get what is a lack of accountability. Yeah. And, and that's the issue is if, if, if you have too many people sharing accountability, you actually don't get the thrust of an, of an activity actually being done by the two key three or three key people that need to be involved and you get overlap. And then that's when you start to get inefficiencies and those four types of negative traits you've talked about. So it's about having the right number of people around the table. It's doing, not doing the right job. Doing the right job. It's With the right much. delegation. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's where it all feeds in. So that's a real challenge for most of corporate Australia these days. It is. And, and look, I, and maybe I, I have to accept I'm possibly old fashioned. I like to look someone in the eyes and know they're responsible. Yes. Um, I'm a big believer in that. Um, when you've got f a structures where three or four people are actually mutually responsible for something, I think you've got chaos. Uh, I like to know that it's, you know, it's Jane's job to do that and that's where the buck stops. So I'm, I'm a very big believer in trying to create that simplicity. One of the areas where uh, when you go into an organisation and you do an org review where you sometimes find a lot of interesting stuff is in... Um, uh, the functional areas, uh, you, corporate services, let's use your phrase. Um, uh, there's normally a lot of savings to be made in corporate services uh, and corporate services is the one area of a business that if you're not careful can grow pretty, pretty quickly. Um, particularly during the good times you can always persuade yourself you need more HR people or more marketing people or more whatever. So you need to look at it very carefully. And it's a great challenge with corporate services. You know, are you, are you, are you going to create a centre of excellence? Are you big enough to create a centre of excellence? Which is not easy to do. Are you going to outsource to people or are you going to sadly sort of sit in the middle and not be a centre of excellence and outsource some things? And I would urge people when they look at their functional areas, they really want to be on the left or the right. You know, we've got clients who run centre of excellences in human resource management, unbelievable. We've actually got clients who pretty much outsource everything to us um, because it's, they just don't have the size, the scale, the volume to be good at it if they did it themselves. So that's proposition number one about the functional side of the equation. And the other one, and I, I'll always challenge this, is um, are you going to be on the get by side of the scale or are you going to be on the indulgent side of the scale? And with functional parts of a business, you want to be very, very mindful of where you sit with that because I can assure you most functional people can always manage to seem very, very busy no matter how badly the business is performing no matter how badly sales are going, uh, they can always find it. So uh, always think of yourself uh, from a functional perspective, are you centre of excellence or you're outsource focused, but also are you a get-by business or are you an indulgent business? 
Now, if you get by, it's got compliance issues. If you're an indulgent business, obviously, it comes at a very, very high cost. So, look, just to wrap that up, um, normal process we would undertake, we'd obviously be undertaking that review, make some recommendations, we'd then enter a planning phase. We've then got a process where we would always be engaging the workforce around what we're doing. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. We've then got the implementation side of it, which might very well mean uh, redundancies, actually moving people around in the organisation, changing who they work for. And then I just want to just say the last two parts. There's a kind of bedding down and an optimisation. I'm really sad to say that most people stop at implementation. Most people kind of get there. They do the redundancies, they do the you're moving now and working for these people and they wipe their brow and off they go. And that's really missing an opportunity. You really need to bed down. You need to make sure that, for instance, that new position descriptions are written, people understand what their new objectives are. And then you need to really be mindful to circle back and make sure all of the new relationships are working really, really well. So at the end of the day, what you really want to be trying to do, of course, is creating simplicity clarity of delegation, um, making sure that uh, families of activity are well aligned together so you get some synergies, um, making sure, very importantly, that, um, as I said, uh, you look somebody in the eye, you can hold them accountable, and be very mindful that the back of the business services the front, the front doesn't service the back, and if you do all of those things, then you should probably be working your way through a pretty decent restructure, I would say. No, I've spoken far too long. No, no. It's passionate, passion about it's Lewis days. Passionate about it's Lewis days. So um, I'm very happy to go into a business and, uh, and uh, do this I exercise. I think one of the challenges, Nigel, for businesses at the moment is in a more traditional environment, you know what the work activity is and you, you have a sense that, okay, for the last five years, this is how we sold our product. This is who we use to, as our channel to market. The difficulty for businesses at the moment is their actual work activities changed because of COVID. So whilst they might be trying to restructure, I think everyone needs to take the time to work out what is it that we do now? What is it that we will be doing in six months? And the very difficult question is what is it that we'll be doing in 12 months? And I'm, I don't know if there's clarity on those questions. Yeah, actually, I think that's a really, really good point. Um, what I'd probably say to a lot of people is I'm seeing a lot of people at the moment try and guess the future. And it makes me very nervous when you try and guess the future. Um, there is absolutely nothing right now. Okay, you might need to downsize a bit. Let's be honest. You, your sales might be reducing, your revenue line might be reducing. Well, that might be just simply about making sure the size of the organisation is right for the market at the moment. But at the moment, what I'd be saying to a lot of people is take a deep breath. Yeah. Just, just wait a few more months until you've got a little bit better sense of clarity. Having said that, there are some businesses who know their core business model isn't going to change. Maybe some of their operating model is going to change, but not their core business model. And they're kind of getting their house in order now. So I really think you, you don't want to jump yep. at shadows or at unknowns too much. Uh, another six months won't kill a lot of businesses as long as they're right-sized. Yeah, and as there might be some businesses right that have no choice right now because that, yeah. the sales position is down here and the we just, labour costs We've just right got here. to right-size the business. We know that for some of our clients, but for others it might be just getting ready to, have to review all of this in the new year. Yeah, yeah, good point. Now, let, let's get into some nitty-gritty, if we can. Uh, we, we got, I think we got so many questions about do I have to consult? So um, I've done my review, I've done my planning, uh, I'm now in that process of I'm going to engage with my people. Do I have to consult? And I thought it was a good place to start. Yeah, else. absolutely. Well, to, to borrow from Nigel's HR hat, the, the first response to that is, well, of course you should, just from a... He said a should, human, though. Yeah, I said should. <laughs> at, at a human interaction level, in terms of trying to maintain engagement, consulting is always a good idea. Um, but if you're interested in the legal answer to that question in terms of what are your legal obligations... It does depend on what governs the relationship with the employees. Most um, people who are covered by an award or enterprise agreement, in fact all of them, will have um, an entitlement to, to consultation clauses with respect to major change. And they all broadly tend to say the same thing, and that is as soon as practicable after you have made the decision to make a major change, so not some point later on down the track, but but effectively, as soon as is possible, after the decision is made to implement a major change, you need to go out to the workforce 
and notify all those employees that are affected by the change about the nature of the changes, about measures that you might be looking to take to mitigate adverse effects on employees. Most consultation clauses will have provisions about acknowledging represent representatives or representational yeah. rights, like to do with unions or other support persons. And most clauses, and this is the one everyone needs to be very conscious of, most clauses will also talk about notifying people of certain things in writing. Yeah. And I was just having a discussion with, a, with another business earlier this morning. There are a myriad of obligations these days in the fair work regime or the fair work world that require employers to put things down in writing. And employers are very bad at this. It's important that you don't just say, oh, yeah, I did all of that. You need to ensure sure that where you were obliged to do things in writing, you did so. So did I explain the adverse effects? Did I explain measures I'm taking to, to mitigate against those effects? The, the only employees that won't have these types of quite prescriptive consultation obligations are those who are agreement or award free, or I should say enterprise agreement or award free. So your employees who are employed under a contract of employment and no award or EA applies to them um, or covers them, they, they will be the employees that you can... Um, that you can take a more efficient or streamlined approach to. But again, if you've got some of your workforce that are award or EA covered and some that aren't, you're probably best adopting a uniform approach to all of them and that'll ensure you don't make any mistakes. I think, I think that's where a lot of people get a little bit confused about the legal side of it. There, there isn't something in the Fair Work Act that says you must consult. It's not in there, right? The obligation arises from a modern award mm it arises from an enterprise agreement, or possibly if you put it in there, it might arise from the contract of employment, yeah. but there's not some universal law in Australia that says if you're going to undertake major change, you have to consult. And the, the words that are really important, the ones Lewis just said, we did say major change, yep. and there's often debates about whether or not what you're proposing constitutes major change to the organisation or production or whatever, and very small changes even though they might be significant for one person, might not actually trigger major change. The other one is most of the triggers say you've, you've got to have made a definite decision. Please read your enterprise agreements carefully. We were reading one the other day and I think the, the words were seriously considered, which is very different to making a definite decision. And normally the major change has to have significant effects, which is job losses, mm. uh, uh, promotional uh, opportunities diminished and things like that. So then they're normally the big triggers. But yeah, there's no universal law in Australia that says you have to consult. I'm with Lewis though from an HR perspective, please consult. We often get asked, and we're getting asked right now, what's a typical period for consultation? How long is a piece of string is my, yep. is my answer. Um, good consultation for, for genuine change, I wouldn't want to see less than a two week period. I think once you're getting over a month, unless it's a fundamentally big change, you probably start to become a little indulgent. And the longer consultation goes on, the more cultural damage you can do. You need to be, you need to find a time period that is reasonable, respectful, but doesn't drag out. And the problem you have if, if you go too short, if you if you have an employee that says, oh, well, I consulted within a day or within two days, is there will start to be a question mark over whether there was a legitimate opportunity for employers to respond, is it genuine? to give feedback, is the consultation genuine? And so even though you may have ticked the boxes in your award obligations, it may be that in substance you actually didn't give an opportunity to respond because it was so lightning fast. That's the concern about going to really short periods. I think we've done that. Um, I haven't been asked this question a lot in, over the years, but we've got asked the question, can I reduce someone's pay? And I, I think this is, an, this is a, a specific response to sort of the pandemic, COVID, um, probably a flow over of uh, JobKeeper, JobKeeper type mm. directions, stand down directions. We've got inundated with people saying, can I reduce somebody's pay? And, and, it, and it's understandable because a lot of businesses are under um, a lot of distress. Um, you'll see on the slide there's three kind of different sources of obligation up there. And probably the most important one is the employment contract. Yeah. So for, for everyone that you engage, whether it's in writing or whether it's not, everyone has an employment contract with their employer. And one of the terms of that contract, again, whether in writing or it's implied, is their rate of pay. And what that means is you cannot change that or reduce it, I should say, in particular, 
without their consent. And um, what that means is that, and we'll put JobKeeper to the side just for a moment. Yeah, I'll put it aside. Yeah. JobKeeper. What that means is you cannot reduce someone's pay unless they agree to it. So for some employers, that may be an absolute bar. You just can't do it. For others, and we've helped a number of employers at the moment in what's been a very difficult period, where they have actually gone to the workforce and explained the dire situation they're in and set out that really everyone needs to chip in, generally for a temporary period, to try and get the business through. We've seen a lot of employees agree to temporary reductions in pay for a period of time. In fact, I'm now starting to see some ongoing indefinite reductions in pay being agreed to. There's the two key things about successfully implementing that. The first is, if you're going to get people to agree to a reduction in pay, you must absolutely be transparent and yep. genuine in your engagement with them. There is no way to, to do this um, both um, legally and, and to actually procure the consent if you use high-level platitudes and are very vague and cliched. You, you actually need to be open and transparent about the state of the business, the state of the revenue pipeline, and why you really need people to jump on board. So that's the first, the first key factor to getting consent. The second key factor is you need to be very careful that there is no express or implied threat that accompanies your comments. And this is the really difficult one um, because let's face it... Unless you do it, we'll do X. Yeah, well, yeah. let's face it. The, the underlying concern is the viability of the business. So if people don't consent, maybe there are going to be redundancies. Maybe there are going to be... Uh, the, is going to be the possibility of parts of the business closing. But you can't openly say that because... We have what's called general protections provisions in the Fair Work Act that prohibit um, employers from treating people adversely or threatening to treat people adversely or coercing them in order to exercise their rights in particular ways. So if you go and say, if you don't agree to a reduction in pay, there will be redundancies. I will make your position redundant. If that is either stated or it is inferred by way of your conduct, you might find yourself the subject of an adverse action claim. So, so what you need to do is go back to step one, which is you need to openly uh, open your hearts effectively and open the books in a way to the, to, to the employees. I'm not saying you give them all the figures, but you basically say this is where the business is heading. We need to take corrective action. Will you help us? And that's about as much as you can do. The more you start to infer uh, threats to someone's job or... Um, uh, or businesses closing, things like that, the more you start to get into the dangerous adverse action territory. So what, what about a modern award? And let's think of two scenarios, because there could be two. One is I pay somebody over the modern award, scenario one. Scenario two is I simply pay somebody on the award. So if I take scenario two to begin with, um, you can't reduce the award rate, and so you're stuck with the award rate. And again, we'll come back to JobKeeper very quickly in a moment. For someone paid over award, it's really that whole contractual analysis yeah. we've just had. And the same applies to enterprise agreements. You can't reduce the enterprise agreement rate unless you get the whole workforce, sorry, not the whole, a majority <laughs> of the workforce to agree to reduce it. So that, that would be basically like a vote? Yes. Just like it is to make the agreement, we have a vote to vary the agreement. That's right. And you could theoretically go to the workforce and try and get a vote up. To Which reduce. some people have done which some people have done. It still needs to pass the better off overall test, which the commission uses to compare the EA to, to the award. Unless you have some really significant consequences or dire circumstances you can point to, and there is a public interest test that allows for EAs to be approved that don't meet the boot. We haven't really seen that utilised yet. We have, uh, not, in fact, not at this time. We've yeah. seen it utilised a little while ago, but very sparingly. Yes. What Lewis is basically saying is you can technically fail the boot, but you've got to run a public interest argument to prove that it's in the public interest to do it. I think if you were in a, a, a very... Let's say you were running a sawmill in Tasmania and you were the only employer in town, and unless this change happened, you were going to go out of business, that might be a good yes. argument for the public interest. We've seen a lot of people not reduce wages in enterprise agreements, but we've seen a lot of people defer this year or next year's wage increase. We've seen quite a bit of that uh, with the consent of trade unions. Mm. So, And I think the, the, the other thing when we talk about these statutory instruments is the availability of JobKeeper. So the JobKeeper provisions are there right now. They do not allow you to reduce someone's hourly rate of pay. 
But what they do allow you to do is if someone can't usefully be employed, there's the ability to stand down employees for all of their working week or part of their working week, change their duties, those kind of things, to make the employee more efficient, less costly over this period, and as well you can direct the taking of annual leave or request the taking of annual leave which the employee can't That reach. is in circumstances where they can't usefully be employed for that period. For the stand down. For the yes. stand down period. That's different to I might be able to usefully employ them, I just want to pay them less money. That's right. Yeah. So, and I mean for employers, the JobKeeper right now, you've only got that till 27 September. So we are seeing employers actually look outside the, the scope of the JobKeeper regime now and say, well, look, we've been through this for now, is it six months since March? It's No, not, not yet. It feels like it's been about... It's like now. a lifetime, Lewis. It's I, I think a lifetime. It's been about four or five months <laughs> since, since we really initially hit lockdown. And I think employers now, well, we've used the temporary measures, but we now need to actually have something a bit more certain and, and long-term. And you can have those conversations provided you're transparent and there's a genuine need. Now, I've got some great questions coming through on culture, but I'll find the right place to drop them in if we can. So let's just talk about redundancy um, because obviously a lot of people are now starting to think either now or possibly after 27 September this might be a journey they have to go down. Um, and we have to get this very basic question about what is the redundancy? So... <laughs> so um, the, the, the term redundancy now has a very settled meaning at law. Yeah. It's got the same meaning in most industrial instruments as it has in the Fair Work Act, and that is that the job the employee is doing is no longer required to be performed by anyone, and that is the reason that the employee has been terminated. So you have a term... And I'm going to come back to this briefly because we've had a, well, a case that's caused a lot of controversy in the last week or so on this, but you have a termination of the employment, the termination is by the employer and it's because the job the employee was doing is no longer required to be performed by anyone. Now, a couple of basic points about that. It doesn't mean that all their duties have to go. It may be that some of the duties the employee was performing are now performed by some other yeah, employee. We split them off to somewhere else Absolutely. to make it more efficient. Maybe some things aren't being done in more, but some things are, but yeah. are being shared amongst other employees. You cannot make someone redundant and then hire another person to do effectively the same work. That wouldn't be a redundancy. It sounds like a replacement of the role um, or replacement of the individual. But you certainly can have some of the duties lingering elsewhere in the business. Yeah. Um, we have often dealt with uh, scenarios where, and I think uh, certainly there's a question about this, where an employee has such a significant change to their duties or remuneration that they argue they've effectively constructively been made redundant. So that is, if, if Nigel approaches me and says, well, look, you were doing jobs A, B and C today, but tomorrow you're only going to be doing job A, you, you're not going to have anyone reporting to you, although... It does a lot more than A, B and C, don't worry about and, that. And your pay, uh, as meagre as it is... is well, now as meagre as it is. ...is now being reduced by 30 or 40%. Um, that's likely a breach of the employment contract if there's no consent. But moreover... The employee may argue, well, you've... You've, you've got rid of my you've job. You've got rid of my job, yeah. 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 And um, that would trigger effectively an entitlement to redundancy if the employee kind of walks away. Interesting decision uh, came out just two weeks two ago, weeks ago yeah. called Broadlex, or, or the employer was Broadlex. Uh, the federal court had an employee that had that type of event, event transpire. They had their hours reduced they had uh, a level of pay reduction and the employee, however, may continued working. They continued working the revised new hours for a couple of years and then at the very years down the track turned around and said, oh, well, actually, at that point in time I was made redundant. It doesn't usually work that way because there needs to be a termination of the employment. Uh, the federal court looked through that and created some... Um, scenario where they said, well, actually, maybe it was, it was terminated that day and, and then rehired, and rehired <laughs> impliedly under a new contract and found a way to give this employee their redundancy pay. Now, a lot of question marks, a lot of interesting questions coming out of the decision, but I suppose it reinforces that employers need to be very careful about reducing people's uh, hours, duties or pay in any material way without consent. And I think it's interesting because when, when we construct employment contracts, we normally have provisions in there which allow some level of change yes. without it triggering the redundancy 
but you do see a lot of employment contracts that say nothing about the level of change that can be imposed before Absolutely. you get to that. And that's an area where if you're going to do an employment contract review, it's probably worth making sure you've got something in there that gives you some level of flexibility. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think, I thought that was clear. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. Um, look, you often get into this debate about legitimate reasons versus illegitimate reasons um, for, for redundancies. Um, I don't think we need to go through them in, in great detail. I think most people understand them. Pr probably the one that is the most problematic one is the one you've just described, because it's not just, it might not just have a legal issue with it uh, in terms of uh, the person who's technically been made redundant claiming unfair dismissal, but it's got a massive HR sort of smell to it. Mm. And that's, you, you go on Friday and miraculously somebody comes along and appears to be doing exactly the same job almost with the same job title, um, and yet we're all running around saying, yeah, well, Lewis was made redundant on Friday. Um, that, that's the one that always troubles me more than anything else. Um, I, I agreed. And, and I think sometimes employers ask us, well, how long till I can re-employ yeah. someone else? And well, there's, there's no rule. Th there is no rule. And, I mean, it may well be the case, particularly right now, that someone's role is no longer required, but it may be needed in future. G genuinely redundant now. It could could be they need Correct. the role back in January. And, and, and there is no rule that says you can't do that. So as long as you genuinely don't need the role now, yes, you may need a very similar role in six months' time. That, that's, that's fine. Um, but where you are manufacturing an artificial scenario just to get rid of a poor performer, well, that's where you expose yourself to unfair dismissal risk. In yeah, you do. You do. Um, and that just sort of takes us on very nicely. What is a genuine redundancy for the purposes of unfair dismissal? And, and just, yeah, very quickly on this, in order to be exempt from unfair dismissal laws, so uh, quite a while ago now, with the introduction of the Fair Work Act, employers have the ability to be effectively exempted from the application of the unfair dismissal laws if they meet three primary criteria, and they are, one, the role was generally redundant. That is, the role no longer needs to be performed by anyone. Two, you comply with all consultation obligations in any applicable award or EA, and we've already talked about that. So you must comply in order to rely on this exemption. And three, it must be the case that the employee could not be reasonably redeployed elsewhere within the business, and that's not just redeployed at the same rate or in the same state. It's redeployed anywhere within the country effectively or within associated entities. And even if there's other roles that might be remunerated less or of lower seniority, the employee must be offered the opportunity to redeploy to those roles if that's reasonably available. Now, if you, um, if you meet each of those threshold requirements, so they're genuinely redundant, the employee has been consulted in accordance with consultation obligations, and they couldn't be reasonably redeployed, that provides an automatic exemption to the unfair dismissal laws. Yeah. And and that's very important because when you get to an unfair dismissal claim, that there's a much more streamlined way of, of not having to go through what was the selection criteria, all these types of other concerns that might arise if you didn't have the benefit of the exemption. Um, obviously, if they're redundant, the final point there is you should ensure you're paying their, their obligations. Um, and that, that had a lot of questions about deciding who goes. Mm. Um, and I just thought it would be useful just to talk about it, uh, if we can, a little bit. Um, Number one, if, if, if Lewis's job is going, then the primary proposition is Lewis is going. <laughs> that's, that's the primary proposition. Um, a lot of people will say, well, what about volunteers? Um, and uh, I, I must say, I tend to wax and wane on volunteers. I think if, um, let's use an example, let's say I've got 10 people in a call centre and I now only need eight, and frankly, they're much of a muchness in terms of their, their skill, their competence, their capability. I think it would be prudent to ask for mm. volunteers because then you've got a much better cultural issue. The people going probably want to go. The people staying probably want to stay. So in the right time at the right place, I think volunteers is a good idea. Outside of that, I'm not a massive fan about calling for volunteers generally because then you might have this terrible problem of, well, Lewis wants to go, but the person who's staying actually doesn't have Lewis's mm. skill set. Gosh, can we retrain them? How long will it take to retrain them? So before you just jump straight into volunteers, 
think about how volunteers plays out. That's yeah, the first and thing I'd a say. great example of that, I think we've heard recently, Qantas is implementing voluntary redundancies for some of its longer serving pilots. But that it works well there because a pilot, with the greatest respect, is generally a pilot's a pilot pilot. They fly a plane, perhaps they need to know certain routes, but they're, they're, there's a level of interchangeability. That's not the same in many corporate roles. Yeah. Um, in your more white collar environment, and that's where you need to be really careful about well, losing you, skill sets. You've also got to be worried in the blue collar environment because uh, the thing that probably frustrates me in the blue collar environment is, you know, let's say that we've got uh, mechanical tradespeople, and we say we've got uh, 15, and we're going to let three three take redundancy, and we ask for volunteers. Do you know who? Do you know who's going to volunteer? The most valuable people. The most the <laughs> three the off. three best people who could probably go and get a job yeah. on Monday exactly. are probably going to volunteer. So just just think long and hard about that. You then get into this classic question of um, selection, selection matrix, um, and all I'm going to say about that before Lewis says what he thinks is this: um, if you're going to do that, make sure it's objective. That's what I, that is what I was the, going to say. The minute you roll into the subjective, you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble. What do you mean by objective? Well, um, uh, are you competent to do the following five things? You're only competent to do, you know, let, you, you can use that machine, that machine, that machine. You can only use these two. Um, so competency would be something I'd be looking at. Um, I'd be looking at experience, the breadth of experience the person's had in, in perhaps in the organisation or in the industry. Um, you might look at their qualifications. Um, uh, so that's the things that are sort yeah. of, uh, you, you can sort of easily quantify uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, performance or, or holding or whatever. The minute you get into are they a good performer or a bad performer, you then start to get into a, the interesting world of, well, you know, do they know that you hold these views? Have you put these views to them and given them a chance to respond? So I'm a big believer in objectivity rather than subjectivity. Now, having said that, been around for 35 years, I know a lot of people when they build a selection matrix they start with the person they want to go and they try and work out how to build the matrix so that person goes. Um, the problem with that is sometimes that can just become a, a, mm. just a, an exercise of folly. And, and again, this is why those unfair dismissal exemption provisions are so important because the Commission will not delve into any of this if you've got the benefit of the unfair dismissal exemptions. But the moment that doesn't apply, all of these criteria arise and you've also got, at any point, unfair dismissal laws applying or not, if you start to enter into absolute red zones, you have discrimination and general protections liability, and that's when you start using absenteeism. Yeah. You, um, uh, it's interesting, the, the word sick leave's up there. It, some of our clients, they're sophisticated enough to know not to call it sick leave, so they call it something else. But uh, absenteeism, presenteeism, complaints, um, all of those types of things um, will inevitably lead to, to a claim and an absolute headache for a business. And, and I, think, I think what I'd probably say about selecting who goes, the minute you move away from it's their job, they're going, um, if you are going to start using a matrix, I'd probably say pick the phone up and ring us because a, a very small investment of our time yeah. early on is going to potentially save you a massive headache, headache later on. Lou, it's it's about twelve minutes to go. Can I do something a bit rad? I thought we might hit some questions. Yes, absolutely. Can we hit some questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I, look, I've I've got some I've got some good ones here. There are a bit some some abstract ones, but um, uh, just bear with me. Advice on how to minimise the negative impact on remaining staff during the process, and I suspect we'll have some interesting views on this. Um, I'm going to start. I'm going to start at the beginning. Um, please don't be disingenuous. Uh, the minute the minute you are disingenuous at the beginning or in the process, um, the minute you start promising things you can't promise, the minute you start hedging and qualifying when you shouldn't, you start to create a very bad environment, not just for the ones potentially going, but for the ones who are staying. So that's, that's proposition yep. number one I'm going to say. Please don't be disingenuous. Um, Over-communicate, don't under-communicate during this, this time. The minute you start to under-communicate, rumours start. Gossip starts, and then when it's all over for the ones who are left, there's often some some problems you've got to solve. So, over communicate rather than under communicate. I would I would then say this: <clears throat> people who are leaving the organisation have friends. They you need to find a way, subject to one or two exceptions, you need to find a way for those people to live with dignity. And dignity might mean letting them work out their notice. <coughs> Uh, dignity might mean making sure that they are free to organise their farewell. Mm. Let them leave with dignity uh, so that the ones who remain 
um, uh, are, are comforted by the fact they were allowed to leave with dignity. Now, there will be an exception to that. If somebody's potentially able to seriously damage your business, their attitude has turned a little sour during the process, then you might be looking to move them on fairly quickly. But I would say dignity is, dignity is a very, very important thing. Yeah, and I just get the sense we advise um, HR officers and directors of business all the time and there's a, there's a fascination with sending people on gardening leave. And I just think that you really need to think long and hard before using that as a lever. Absolutely, if someone has demonstrated a propensity to damage your business in any way, um, misusing confidential information, anything like that, absolutely use your full um, abilities, which include cutting them off from the system, directing them to a stay from home during the nose period, absolutely. But if that's not the case, um, and there are, isn't really an impediment to the person sticking at least even part of their notice period, um, I don't see why you wouldn't do that. I, I don't see what, what damage is caused. Um, the only other thing, while I've, I've got the floor, Nigel, <laughs> is I think you talked about um, not being disingenuous, and we've talked about transparency and all these things through the process. One of the things that I, I think really does help with people communicating with the workforce at this time is if you don't know the answer, if you don't know... Tell them you don't know. Tell them you don't know. No. You don't know whether there's going to need to be more cuts or if you don't know um, when the revenue is going to increase. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Don't know. Because you actually start to build the empathy of the people that you're trying to manage and say, well, I don't know. I'm doing the best I can with the information in front of me and that's, that's the best I can do. And there's nothing wrong with saying that um, if it's delivered honestly and with the overall message that the business is doing what it can to protect jobs. And I think I think we sometimes get a little bit too uh, uh, sort of parental with how we talk in a workforce. I think you know, a lot of blue-collar workers, sophisticated people, understand the reality of what's going on. They would respect I don't know yes. rather than a manufactured yep. answer every time. So I think it's really important. Probably, And then probably what I'd probably say is, look, um, for some people, when this is over, the people who are remaining, they have very interesting psychological responses. Some people have great relief. Uh, it's not it's not me. Some people then have guilt. Um, you know, I, I kept my job, but my good friend Lewis didn't. So you're going to have to be mindful that there's going to be a kind of period of readjustment. For some people, it might even be a little bit of grieving. And I tend then let that go for a couple of weeks, and then I want them to refocus. So... Let's talk about what their role is now in the organisation. Um, let's talk about have they got a new manager? How, how am I going to make sure that these people are positively engaging together and talking about the future? And what I would probably say for the most part then is, is that start refocusing on if, if it's a new team, even if it's a smaller team, what am I going to do subtly in, in small ways to start to get them thinking about how they want to behave, how they want to improve? So I'm now talking about I'm out of the trough, and, and we're now in this together and off we go. So probably just that's probably how I'd say what's the best way to deal with the people who are left behind. That's that's probably the best way. I, I've got some more, but have you got have you got some I've got a couple which I'm really you, interested in. You shoot with the next one and I'll I'll get on the iPad. Um look I've I've got a really uh, look we could we could spend an hour talking about this question alone, which is what's the best way to change culture of a unit um during a period of realignment? Um and, and I'm going to give you the 30-second answer and then I'm going to apologise for it only being in 30 seconds. But um, uh, number one, uh, uh, got to remember that most cultures have been built over many, 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 many years. And if you think that you're going to change a culture overnight, you're sadly mistaken unless you are in an uncontroversial crisis and everybody believes that they've got to change, otherwise survival is out of the question. So absent that crisis, changing culture takes a lot of time. The, the most important things for me in terms of starting the cultural journey are um, uh, start with the person who's the most senior person in the unit. And the question would be, have you identified the key behaviours you now want that unit to demonstrate? And does that person demonstrate and live them on a daily basis? So every time somebody looks up at Lewis, do they see Lewis demonstrating those behaviours? And my next question then would be, are those behaviours permeating in how you recruit, how you promote, uh, how you do performance management? So over a relatively short period of time, it's understood how we now behave as opposed to how we didn't used to behave. Now, that might involve surgery. Some people might come on that journey. Some people will fail to come on that journey. But you've got to become unrelenting about what those new behaviours are. But they start at the top. 
and then they work their way down. They don't start at the bottom and work their way up. So, look, culture's a hard one, but that's probably my 30-second answer for changing the, the culture. Uh, another question that's come up on a different angle, it's come up repeatedly in our webcasts and a number of questions uh, again today about employees preferring to work from home and whether they can now refuse to return to the workplace. We're getting asked whether, this question a lot, aren't we? Yeah, and whether we can direct them to return to the workplace. There's a few things about that. The, the starting point needs to be the public health orders. You need to remember in a, in a number of states, particularly Victoria and New South Wales, we still have public health orders in place that um, in Victoria, for instance, really prohibit people from leaving the home unless they can't practically work there. Or in New South Wales, as another example, employees are um, entitled to work from home if they wish, provided they can practically do that at home. So that's your starting point. But let's say that you, you can establish that, that an employee must be at work and the employee is refusing to come in. You've got a whole range of things that you need to consider. The first is going to be why is the employee refusing to come in? Is there some underlying medical condition they're talking about? If so, this might be a matter that we deal with like like other absences due to illness or injury, which is are there medical reasons that they can evidence, which means they can't come in. If it's not about medically not being fit to work, but they've just got a disinclination or a lack of preference, there's two things you need to think about. At the HR and cultural side, well, what adjustments and accommodations can we make to try and make the person feel comfortable? But at the end of the day, your job as an employer is not necessary to eliminate all risks to the workplace all the time. There's always inherent risks. Um, but it's to minimise them as much as reasonably practicable. And what you should be doing is demonstrating how you've minimised those risks. And provided that you have, you can start issuing directions to employees to attend, provided that there isn't a medical reason why they can't, provided that all appropriate measures are taken, but most importantly, provided they can't practically do the work from home. And for many employees, who've been successfully working from home for a while now, that might be a challenge to actually establish that. But they're the issues you need to work through. I'd encourage you to give us a call yeah, if yeah. you're dealing with that type of issue. It, it, it's very case-specific. It's, case specific. it's Absolutely. very case-specific. And there's so many different factors to consider. But that's come up quite a lot, so it's still obviously something that, that employers are grappling with. Uh, let, me, let me jump in, because there's, there's a really good one here. Um, are redundancies under closer scrutiny compared to previous years by the Fair Work Commission because of COVID? It's a great question. There's a lot more unfair dismissal cases pertaining to redundancy. Now, does that mean they're under greater scrutiny? Well, there's more claims being made, so there's more disputes about redundancy in the Commission, yes. The, the Commission is conscious, though, that a lot of businesses are under genuine yeah. distress. And so if there is clearly uh, an inability to maintain the same workforce and the role is genuinely not required, uh, the Commission will quite dispassionately, dispassionately apply those criteria. And, and you will likely be fine. If there's funny play involved, maybe not. Yeah, and I, look, it's interesting. I, I, I don't think the Commission's taking a different approach. You're right, there's more claims. If I look back over a great many years of, of working in recessions and things like that, you, I know you weren't born, Lewis, I appreciate that, but sorry, it's just a little joke on Lewis. Um, he's both intelligent and young, which annoys the hell out of me all the time. Um, uh, if you look back at uh, past recessions, I think there probably was a tipping point where the Commission started to scrutinise a little harder. I suspect we might see that as we get into next year if the economy is genuinely faltering. But at the moment, I'm not seeing it. I, I just think you're right. There's just more claims at the moment. Um, and there's a lot of, lot of claims around consultation and failure to consult. Yes. And that, that, that's a big area that people probably need to think about. We could probably got one more before we finish. Do you, do you want to grab it or...? Uh, yeah, no, you can go if you've got well, one. Uh, well, have, you, have you got one? Uh, yeah, so um, I'll, I'll take uh, this, this one, which is interesting. Should a skills matrix be done before, during or after consultation? And I take it this is a question about... How know, do you pick people? How do you pick people? And this is a really difficult challenge. Your obligation to consult is after the decision is made to introduce the changes. So you are starting the consultation after you've decided we're going to have a number of roles go or this di these two divisions are going to be... Merged together. That's the point at which you consult. What you might then do as part of the consultation is say, well, if people, um, particularly in a spill and fill situation, you might say we're going to be selecting people if you're interested in these roles, please let us know. But it is you who conducts the assessment. You're not 
necessarily consulting on, well, should you be the person who stays or can I get your input as to what skills matrix I should use? I think once you start to get to that point, you start to open a Pandora's box. Yeah. The consultation is about the nature of the changes, what you're proposing to do about it, and it's at that introductory level. You will give the employees the opportunity to provide feedback. Once you've taken on that feedback, you will make the decision. Absolutely, if you're going to be applying an objective selection criteria, you might inform employees that if there's more applicants for a role, then um, you'll, you'll be selecting based on some objective criteria. But I'd be very concerned about going to the employees and seeking their individual feedback on each element of your criteria because I think it becomes unwieldy. And I think that's, that's that interesting part about uh, sort of the phases of activity. The first phase of activity to, in terms of engaging with people is telling them what the decision is and the likely impact of that decision. The next phase then is really how am I going to implement mm. that, the outcome of that? And probably, probably my, my takeaway is always this, um, putting aside we're not using a matrix or not, just remember this, no matter how bad they are, the more choices an employee has in this process, the more they'll feel empowered. And it might just be that their choice is simply, do you want to go on Thursday or Tuesday at least they've got some ability to think they've got some control over some very small element. So, again, uh, I think it's about the phases. I suspect um, there's nothing legally wrong with having the matrix in your kit bag before you kick off, nothing at all. Um, uh, if it's one of those matrices which is sort of designed to create an outcome, be careful about that. But, yeah, I'm with Lewis. I wouldn't be sort of throwing the matrix on the table and trying to democratically fill it out as part of the consultation process, I wouldn't be doing that. Hopefully that answers uh, that, that viewer's question. Now, it's, it's 101. We, we have 102 now. 102 now. We, we have run out of time. We might come back. We, we'll let uh, Joe and uh, Ian do JobKeeper next week. <clears throat> and we might come back and we might have a, another go at some of these key areas because I suspect over the next couple of months we're going to get asked a lot more about them. So, look, I, I'm sorry if we haven't got to everything today for you. Hopefully we've got to a fair bit. As always, please give us a call if you need any help. And in the meantime, Lewis, stay safe. Same for And you. Uh, please, to all our viewers, uh, stay safe. Uh, like you, I suspect we're hoping that it doesn't get any worse at the moment. Uh, there was a sense there that we were getting through this and hopefully we'll get through it uh, as soon as we can. And please tune in next week to Joe and uh, Ian and you'll learn the fine details of JobKeeper 2.0. And take care, everybody. Be well. See you later.